Cerebrolysin is purified uh, um, pig uh, growth factors from the brain. Not the brain of the pig, but the growth factors, namely brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, glial cell-derived neurotrophic factor. So I've been injecting this in me a little bit experimentally to see if it could help my clients who are addicts or recovering from addiction. So the Blood Lord, uh, he's a longtime subscriber with a funny name, but great guy. He asks a good question. He says, first two podcasts with Mike were great. I would be interested in a discussion about nerve damage and its prevalence in fighting sports, both central nerve damage and peripheral. He said leg kicks to nerves have been TKing fighters of late. Can fighters use nerve growth factors such as cerebrolysin for recovery and or prevention of long-term problems? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll tell you more about cerebrolysin later, but do people get peripheral nerve damage and central nerve damage from fights? I'll say yes. Hmm. Interesting. There's, there's a lot of damages known and unknown in combat sports. Mm -hmm. You think about how frail the human body actually is and, and what the, the demands of this sport are mm -hmm. in the training. I mean, the training is 300 days a year, probably once and twice a day. So 600, excuse me, 600, you know, 500 to a thousand training sessions, maybe depending on the athlete, pretty intense, right? You know, mm -hmm. high contact, very irregular um, movement patterns, you know, scrambles and twisting and turning and lots of shit gets shifted pretty easily. Mm. Um, fuck, man. I, I pulled my groin, just shifted my ass from one pillow to the other on my couch not too long ago. Like, to, to be to happen, to right? like three days to get over that. <laughs> <laughs> that starts to happen. Yeah, I know. Right, right. I uh, move so wrong means, and something gets injured. Yeah. <laughs> It happens. So MMA, MMA, yeah, yeah. Nerve damage. Absolutely. Absolutely. All sorts of damage is, is happening. So I, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, Mike, but I, I really read a lot about TBIs because I'm, I had TBIs when I was younger, but also I'm like trying to preserve my brain function as I age. Yeah. So a lot of the, the ways I can learn about that is either through neurodegenerative disease, like Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, there's a lot of research there. Then there's a lot of research on TBIs. A couple of things I noticed about TBIs that I'm not sure people are doing in MMA that probably would be very useful. One of them is pretty innocuous, a beta blocker. An adrenaline receptor blocker, when given right after a, a TBI, tremendously improves recovery. Mm -hmm. Tremendously. There's a lot of studies on this showing even if you don't take it before. By the way, the same thing happens in surgeries, interestingly. The reason why is this. Apparently, the adrenaline system increases the inflammation from the injury. So when you get a TBI, apparently, the first incident of the strike causes some damage, but most of the damage comes from the inflammation consequent to the strike. That depends a little bit on adrenaline to do that. So that's one thing I learned that could be really useful for MMA. I use a beta blocker almost every morning because I have high adrenaline anyway. So I just like to smooth out my adrenaline in the mornings when adrenaline peaks. Yep. It's pretty innocuous. Sometimes when I get stressed, I'll take a beta blocker as well. All it does is block adrenaline lasts six to eight hours or so. That's one thing. The second thing I learned, which is something I've been using, experimenting a lot with myself, is called cerebrolysin. Cerebrolysin is purified uh, um, pig uh, growth factors from the brain. Not the brain of the pig, but the growth factors, namely brain-derived neurotrophic factor, nerve growth factor, glial cell-derived neurotrophic factor. So I've been injecting this in me a little bit experimentally to see if it could help my clients who are addicts who are recovering from addiction. Because ibogaine really helps people get off addiction and it increases neurogenesis, uh, the growth of new neurons in the brain. So I thought this might work. Turned out really to work. Helped a lot of people get off opiates already. The other thing that it does is basically because of these growth factors coming in the brain, when you have growth factors in the body, it doesn't just cause cells to divide. It also causes cells not to die when they're attacked. The growth factors prevent cells from dying. So cerebrolysin was actually invented to, to treat TBIs. It's actually mainly given for that. I've been using it off label for other stuff, but it's interesting that in the US they don't use that. I've never heard of, and I've talked to a bunch of psychiatrists in LA telling them about cerebral license. They just never heard of it. So in Eastern Europe, they use it a lot. It's extremely effective. You can feel it the next day. You, you, you feel the neurogenesis in your mind. You sleep, you rest. It's like taking a lot of growth hormones. It's very interesting. How safe is this to take on a regular basis? Is it recommended for a regular basis outside of uh, trauma, you know, one-time trauma for just life and, and longevity? Great question. So it's never been used in a long-term basis. It's only been used as an injection for five to 10 days in a row following either stroke or TBI. However, okay. I used it 
for a couple of reasons. So the background is this. So the way SSRIs work to treat depression is actually they increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor in the brain. And apparently in animals, all, all mammals, if you give them more growth factors, they get not depressed and less anxious. So I wanted to see if cerebrolysin could do that for people that are scared of SSRIs for short-term use. And it works for that also. So I've been experimenting with these things. These may be a bit more dangerous, but using them right after a TBI for five days, that has been used for 40 years, never been any sign of any side effects. No prion, uh, that brain stuff, none of that. So there's um, no evidence. It's very interesting. I thought to tell you about it. Now, moving to the next question by Jay Motes. He wanted to ask you about dieting. He said, if you're on a strict cutting diet, trying to get body fat to extremely low levels, does Mike believe in using carbohydrates? If so, what meals would he use them in? And what's his go-to carbohydrates and why? For weight loss. Well, I had mentioned the importance of fruit mm -hmm. that we maintain. We keep that in. We eat white rice, we eat oats, we eat quinoa, amaranth, barley, um, chickpeas, black beans, um, as well as just a wide variety of produce, butternut squash and, and such things as they're- You like other. lentils? Lentils, loves okay. lentils. Yeah, lentils with a few poached eggs on top. I had lentils um, with three poached eggs on top and some charred cauliflower. Beautiful. Fucking yeah. for breakfast, it's amazing, right? And you know, <laughs> it, it, of course, you, know, you think about the long-term effects of the carbohydrate conversation, maybe to slowly go on that. Mm. Carbohydrate is the primary fuel source for all athletic activity and cognitive function and life processes in, in many ways. The reduction of an essential fuel source makes no sense. It's, it's a contradictory thought pattern for a stated outcome. Knowing this, we must then remove the options off the table. So instead of cutting carbs to lose weight, cutting carbs to get fat, we use carbs to initiate other processes. Mm -hmm higher intensity levels of training, greater execution of specific types of movement as you're strategic with carbohydrate intake. So I put that out there again to think about the preservation of the health, the health of the organism, as opposed to just simply the, 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 the weight loss, fat loss goal, which in our experience and, and opinion, will be never any better and likely less anyway than a healthful approach, which again, utilizes carbohydrates. So I, you know, and that's the, the, the mix. It doesn't of, explored a lot. Yeah. It's clear. Yeah. It, it seems it, to be, yeah. But it's so, so rarely followed as mm -hmm. your practice, my practice, I'm sure we come because across the same. Confused it's so, people. it's so tempting for people to want the diuretic effect of going on a ketogenic diet. It just, it looks so, it looks like they lost so much weight. So the feeling of that is just so attractive. I think it makes people, you know, cause you lose, you lose 10 pounds the first week. So you felt like it's more effective. It's hard to ignore that aspect, you know? Mm -hmm.